Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our webinar this afternoon, selecting an off-site GMP storage provider. We have a lot of great information to get to today, but a few quick items before we start. Toward the bottom of your control panel, um, you will see a handout section where there's a PDF of our presentation available for you to download and also a copy of our most recent white paper about also about selecting an off-site storage provider on the same topic as our presentation today. Both of those are available if you click on them to download. Um, also on the download of the presentation today, there's contact, info, contact information for all of our panelists. If you want to reach out to them directly or visit us online for more information, you can find contact information there. There will be a Q&A session at the end of our presentation today. If you have a question you would like our panel to answer, you can submit that question in the question box on your control panel at any time during the presentation, or you can send us a message in the chat. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be sent to all attendees within 24 hours, so you can keep an eye out for that. And uh, now I would like to hand it over to Kaylin IEC to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Amy, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are very excited to be discussing selecting an off-site GMP storage provider. This is one of those topics that it truly doesn't matter if you've been doing offsite storage for years or if this is your first time doing uh, offsite storage. Uh, people always have a ton of different questions regarding this subject. They always want to know what, what really goes on behind the, behind the doors at the storage provider. Um, how can you track my products? Um, what kind of chambers do you use? What kind of security systems do you use? How are you monitoring our product? So myself and the team are very excited today to be able to share our knowledge as well as answer any questions that you may have about this at the end of our broadcast today. So let me introduce the panelists. Let me start with myself. I'm Kaylin Aisi, and I'm one of three product managers here at Mossy Bioservices. Mossy Bioservices is a service provider. So we offer validation, calibration, monitoring, equipment rental and sales, thermocouples, uh, but my responsibility and my team's responsibility is the biorepository. So our job is to introduce clients, new clients, potential clients, um, existing clients to all of our capabilities and redundancies. But really one of the key parts of our jobs is truly understanding what our clients needs are for their storage so we can provide them with the storage, with the best storage uh, proposal for them. Um, we also work with them on quotes. We also work with them on the purchase orders. And then once we've completed our aspects of it, we transition them over to the operations team. So I'm so excited today to be able to introduce our first panelist, which is Mike Devonzo. Mike Devonzo and his team are responsible for materials. So whether our clients require uh, Mike's team to come out to their facilities and pack up their materials, or just to pick up their materials, or their materials are shipped into our facilities, Mike's team is the one that basically manages those materials. So their team takes in the materials, they inventory the materials, they get the materials into the proper conditions and manage the materials the entire time they're in storage. Mike's team is also responsible for any of the outgoing shipments. So however our clients need to have products packed out for their shipments, Mike's team is responsible for doing that and getting them prepared to their next location. Michelle, I'd like to introduce as one of our biorepository managers here at Mossy, and she works with Mike's team as well. So before products come into the bio storage facility, there's a lot of work that goes into it. We truly need to understand what's coming in, how much material, what condition, if there's anything special about it, anything unique that the team needs to know. Michelle's team compiles all that information and makes sure that Mike's team has that. So as soon as the product hits the dog, Mike's team knows exactly how to manage the materials. That also goes for the outgoing shipments. Michelle's team is responsible for getting all that information and then forwarding that over to Mike's team. I'd also like to introduce Stephanie Dumas. She's one of our quality supervisors here in the biorepository. So Steffi is very busy ensuring that we're up to date and compliant in all of our activities here. Um, if you've ever had the opportunity to be able to audit our facility, you might recognize Stephanie from that, or if you have the opportunity to audit us in the near future, Stephanie heads up all of our auditing. So let us move on to the agenda and what we'll be talking about today. 
So we're going to be explaining why GMP storage is a science and some of the critical items that you need to understand when you're thinking about offsite storage. So going through the agenda, we're going to be talking about planning for offsite GMP storage. We're going to be talking about site integrity, the facility and equipment integrity, chamber monitoring and control, product safety and inventory control, and compliance procedures. And as Amy said at the beginning of the webinar, at the very end, we've saved some time for your questions and answers. And so as we're going through the presentation today, if you think of something, please jot that down and we'll be able to get to that at the end. In the event that we run out of time at the end of the webinar, that's okay, please consider, please forward in your questions. We will make sure to answer those after the webinar in case we can't get to it. So moving on, um, before we get to the actual science and the technical part of the storage side, we wanted to take a couple minutes and let's let's talk about some of the things you really need to be think of, thinking about when you're thinking about offsite storage. So one of the very first things that comes up is when. When is the appropriate time to be thinking about offsite storage? And I think one of the best ways to answer that question is to think about when you don't want to be thinking about storage for the first time. So for any of those of you out there that have gotten that call at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon from the facilities manager, letting you know that your chamber that's been on the fritz for the last couple months has finally died and they're not sure when the product's gonna, when the, when the chamber is gonna be able to be fixed. Uh, hope you have a solution for your, for your product in the chamber. That's obviously not the first time you wanna be thinking about storage. You truly need to be thinking about storage right in the very beginning. And we're gonna be going through a lot of different aspects today as to why it's so important to be thinking about it. Why do you need offsite storage? There's truly hundreds of different reasons why you can need offsite storage. Uh, it could be anything from kind of what we were just talking about, potentially having aging equipment, um, material, you know, equipment that, um, do you wanna to continue to replace equipment? Um, supply chain constraints. Do you have enough room at your facility to continue to add materials? One of the key things that we all deal with, especially whether there's a, a pandemic, not a pandemic, um, is long lead items for our supply chain, right? So it's critical that you keep your supply lines running, that you keep your manufacturing lines running, and you have to ensure that you have those long lead items. So you end up going out, you secure all those items, but they end up taking a lot, a lot of space. Is it essential that you keep all those on hand at your fingertips, or is that possible that you could be storing some of those long lead items off, off site? Um, some other things that sometimes generate uh, off site storage needs is um, capital expenditures. You know, how many chambers do you want to continue to add to your facility? Anytime you add chambers, you have to add the redundancies that go with that, and then you're adding additional staff to be able to manage all of that as well. And sometimes it's truly just space within your facility how much additional space do you want to continue to add for additional chambers or is it possible that you could offload some of your materials off-site to provide extra room for lab space or whatever you might need so one of the key things we truly would like for you to take away from this webinar today and as we go through this is that storage truly truly cannot be an afterthought it really has to be in the forefront of what you're thinking about another question that people always ask is who who can store product offsite? You know, do you have to be a large organization? Do you have to be a global organization? And the answer to that is, is no. You can truly be a small startup company, even if you only have two people. If you think about a startup company, you're taking your funds, you wanna use those funds for your research, not necessarily to get a chamber, get a second chamber. Do you have it validated, calibrated properly? Do you need to have it monitored? So they're able to focus on their research and be able to have their products off somewhere else. Um, for the smaller companies to the mid-sized company, again, it could be they have a potential study that they're running, that it's maybe a one-time study. Do they really need to buy an extra chamber for this one-time study that's only gonna be one once, or is it better to send that off somewhere else? For the global organizations, they need to move product so quickly throughout the world it's perfect for them to have different locations all over the place. Which brings us to where. Where should you have your product stored? And that's sometimes overlooked. And you really truly wanna think about what you're storing offsite. Once the product is done with the storage, where's the product going? Is all your product going to one location? 
Is it going to multiple locations? Is it going all over the country? Is it going globally? So those type of things are key essentials to think about. You know, do you, does your storage facility need to have a fleet of van and trucks to be able to transport your product? Does it need to have refrigerated trucks? Especially if they're going all over the country or globally, you might want to think about being at a storage provider that's within an hour of a major international airport so you can get your products to where it needs to go. Uh, that's going to absolutely reduce your transportation costs. It's going to streamline the chain of custody process as well as reduce risk to your product. So now that you've figured out when, where to store your product, um, you need to be thinking about a couple major things before you're actually ready to contact a storage provider. So you've worked really hard, you know, coming up with, with your products and you put a lot of time and effort and research it. So you want to make sure that you're taking all the information and everything that you know about your product and being able to forward that onto your storage provider. That's only going to help ensure that your product remains at temperature and safe and secure. So some of the things you want to be thinking about are what are your storage requirements? Is this a, is this a one-time need that you need storage for? Is it short-term? Is it long-term? Do you have a large stability study coming up for over 36 months that you're going to need pulls, this, that, everything else? Is it a potentially unique situation where you're looking for mirror banking? Is it an emergency storage? So having a clear understanding of what your needs are. And you also want to be thinking about, you know, is, is, is this a one-time need or is your needs going to continue to grow? And is that storage provider going to be able to provide those additional needs as you continue to grow? Obviously, some obvious things you want to be thinking about clearly is what storage temperatures you need to have. Is it multiple storage temperatures? Is it only one storage temperatures? You also want to be thinking about what type of products you want to be able to store. Um, do you have, are they with trains? Are they API? Are they medical devices? Do you have SDS, BSL information? All that information is going to be very helpful to the storage provider. And then obviously, how much material are you thinking of storing offsite? Are you just thinking of storing a couple vials? Do you have a couple boxes you're looking to store offsite? Are you looking for pallets? Having a clear understanding of how much space that you need and if that space is going to grow over time. Something else that's really key to be thinking about is if there's anything unique about your storage product that's coming in. So for instance, if your product is sensitive to light, that's something that you're going to want to be able to tell your storage provider. Or for the storage, is it something unique that it has to be stored, potentially inverted, or some unique position that the team needs to know about it? All that additional information that you can help provide and be thinking about upfront will help streamline the process for you. Another thing to be thinking about is we've talked about transportation. When your product comes in for storage, eventually it's going to leave. When it leaves, does it have unique packaging that you need to be thinking about, or can you use generalized packaging? Are you going to require temp tails? Do you have your unique temp tails that you need? Do you want your storage provider to manage validated shippers that you've already set up, or is it okay for them to use their own supply? Also, it, transportation is another key thing you want to be thinking about. Um, do you require transportation, meaning you need somebody to come pick up your product, or do you work with a third party that can ship product in? So truly having a clear understanding of all those things is truly going to help you come up with this best storage solution for you. Um, so um, we've gone over a lot of different information at this top part of the, of the webinar here. So if you have any questions on anything I've discussed at the first part, I look forward to answering your questions at the end. Uh, this leads us to our first audience poll question. Uh, so we're going to give you 30 seconds. So our first question for today is, have you used validated GMP storage before? So obviously you can choose one of the selections before, whether it's yes, on site at my facility, yes at an off-site storage facility, no or don't know. So we appreciate you taking a couple seconds and answering those questions for us. And I think we're just about done. And I believe the results are coming in. 
Perfect. So it looks like we've got 63% with yes on my site, and it looks like we've got a mix of 11% yes at an offsite and 20%, 26% no. So thank you so much for taking a couple moments to answer that. That gives us a good understanding of who our audience is, and hopefully we'll be able to answer a lot of your questions as we continue on. So I'm very excited to introduce Mike Devonzo, and Mike Devonzo will be speaking about our site integrity. Mike. All right, thank you very much, Kaylin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us here with us today. Again, my name is Mike Devonzo. I'm the operations supervisor for our cold chain buyer repository here at Massey. Uh, so we'll start off with site integrity. So there, of course, there are many topics and discussion points uh, regarding site integrity. Uh, but today we're gonna we're gonna take a look at some of the things regarding access controls, standard operating procedures, fire suppression, and monitoring systems. Uh, so we'll start with access controls. So an access control system, it's a security system that, it's a security method that ensures only authorized personnel are being allowed entry into designated facilities, areas, rooms, or chambers within an organization. Typically, you'll, a typical access uh, method you'll see is the use of swipe or scan badge at strategic points within a facility. Uh, but regardless of the type of badge system that's used, What's important is that the badge can be attributed uh, physically on personnel and within the system to individual employees. The system also needs to be able to set access permissions by location, and it needs to be able to set access hours for specific locations. For example, if an employee is only allowed in a specific area during their work shift, or if they require extended access based on their role within the company. Typically, most employees are going to have general access to areas within the facility. So we're talking lobbies, cafeterias, entryways. Uh, so it's important that there's a clear distinction to a second level of access within the facility. Typically, this is uh, used via security doors and that second level of access. Uh, the last and most critical level of access control is regarding the actual chambers of the rooms themselves in which product is being stored. So these are areas in which personnel have direct access to product. Uh, so it's a critical point that needs to have that additional security. Typically, this can be covered with that badge access system. Uh, you may see standard lock and key systems implemented depending on the size of the facility. But in my opinion, the best practice is an independent electronic locking system, which again, I consider that a best practice, a best practice because it can be individually attributed to employees and it's also independent of that batch system. So just as important as it is to have those physical access controls in place, it's, it's extremely important to have procedures that detail all of those controls, uh, mainly because documented procedures, they ensure that the employees are being trained properly and it's a consistent execution of the company's vision when it comes to site integrity. Some of the things to look for in these procedures would be what are the employee expectations and requirements regarding site integrity? What is the company's policy for visitors coming on site to do or handle their material? What are their expectations and their requirements to gain that access? Also, what are the organizational responsibilities for site integrity? Who's responsible for oversight of the program? Who, who is uh, responsible to ensure that employees are being trained properly and following, the, and following that policy? And the last thing you want to look for is some safety measures and what the responses to those safety measures are for that site. The last topic we'll talk about here is fire suppression and alarm monitoring. So, the, of course, the facility itself should be equipped with fire suppression systems, should be the right system for the area. Uh, an effective fire suppression system that can go a long way in buying you precious time during an emergency event. And again, it can go a long way in safekeeping of material. Uh, it should be designed to not only locate, uh, alert, excuse me, local authorities, but it should also alert key personnel within the organization in the event an alarm is triggered. Uh, that helps provide a rapid response and could potentially uh, mitigate any damage to the actual product being stored. And to wrap up, lastly, an alarm monitoring system should be in place. Uh, this is especially critical for after hour, after normal operations. You want to have visibility of what's going on at the facility at all times. 
So this system, it should again be designed to locate to alert uh, local authorities, also key organizational personnel in the event there's an alarm triggered. Uh, again, that's visibility offsite. You want to know, you want to have comfort in knowing that the organization has complete 24/7 visibility. Uh, so to summarize, uh, you know, an effective access control system, robust standard operating procedures, and intuitive fire suppression and alarm monitoring systems that should really provide you with that baseline layer of confidence that you need uh, to, to feel that the provider is able to fulfill the offsite storage needs that you're looking for. Uh, so with that, that'll wrap up the, the site integrity part of it. I'll, I'll go ahead and send it back over to Kaylin. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So everything Mike talked about were key essential safeguards that are put in place to ensure your materials are safe and secure during the storage process. So next up, we have Michelle, and Michelle will be talking about the facility and equipment integrity. Michelle. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, as Kaylin mentioned, my name is Michelle Mayer. I'm the Bar Repository Manager here at Massey, and I'm very happy to be here to discuss some critical points that any storage provider should take with regards to facility and equipment integrity. So in other words, to ensure your product is held in a location that safeguards it from situations that could have unintentional or unexpected negative impacts. So the one critical factor um, is power. Equipment needs to be reliable in all situations. For instance, um, are there generators on, at the facility and are there built-in redundancies for those generators? Definitely having multiple generators um, is, is a plus. And also if they're equipped with automatic transfer switches, that can be considered an essential element. To support those generators, are there service contracts with vendors? And are there multiple field providers to choose from that are local? You definitely want to ensure the facility has easy access to fuel in severe situations. Um, as we, we know, you know, in the Northeast, there could be major snowstorms, extended power outages, as we're familiar with, um, or any other emergencies that come up unexpectedly. So those generators need to be able to power the building and the chambers within it for 24-7 uh, for extended periods of time. So you definitely want to um, look into that. Um, another point to consider is whether the chambers inside the facility have built-in redundancies as well. For example, are there empty reach-in chambers on standby to accommodate product if there is an emergency? Um, if, if product needs to be moved. And because most places will not have an extra room or warehouse hanging around empty, having two compressors on large walk-in chambers is important. Um, the compressor should also automatically switch from one to another after a predefined period of time, and also have the capability to run concurrently for a quick cool down if they're utilized for a freezer. Also, it's good to know whether there's LN2 backup capability. Um, this would be to maintain temperature in freezers and ultra cold storage if those compressors are down that we were just talking about. Um, and then um, speaking of LN2, for LN2 storage specifically, the need for backup empty LN2 tanks is minimal if the facility has redundant LN2 bulk supply tanks on site available. Um, switching gears a little bit, you're also going to want to verify that the storage provider has a robust pest control program in place to provide a sanitary environment for your product. <clears throat> Having um, an integrated pest management program, otherwise known as an IPM, will mean that that facility, facility has processes in place for monitoring, preventing, and controlling infestations. Um, the program should also include a method of tracking so that trends can be identified and problems can be prevented, hopefully before they become a real issue. Um, lastly, when it comes to courier service and logistics, knowing whether that service provider offers their own courier services is going to help you plan the actions that you need to take ahead of time regarding product integrity during transport. Um, if they provide a local courier service, you know, maybe they offer door-to-door -door services. They may offer, um, you know, that hands-on transportation as well as traceability for your shipment, uh, real-time temperature monitoring, and in some cases, even GPS tracking capabilities. 
um, if you won't be, if they don't have a courier service and you're working with a 3PL provider or shipping um, using parcel services, that storage provider should still offer logistics and shipment coordination services. So communicating with carriers on your behalf to ensure that your shipments are set up when they leave that facility according to your instructions. Um, definitely understanding and planning for all of these needs ahead of time is going to help you um, work through your this, this project with your storage provider and ensure your product's integrity from the time it hits their threshold through the time it leaves their hands when it's shipped back to you. Um, thanks for listening. I look forward to answering any follow-up questions you may have, and I believe I'm handing it back over to Kaylin. Thank you, Michelle. So Michelle went over some excellent, excellent information. One thing that we can't stress enough is redundancies, redundancies, redundancies. They are absolutely critical to the storage operation. So no matter where you're looking for an offsite storage provider, you want to ensure that they have as many redundancies as possible. So thank you, Michelle. And next, we're gonna be turning it back over to Mike Gavanzo to be talking about temperature monitoring and control. Mike. All right, thank you, Kaylin. Uh, so Michelle did a great job talking about the importance of maintaining temperature, the necessity of remaining operational 24 seven via those equipment and facility redundancies. Uh, another important aspect that goes along with that is the monitoring of temperature within those controlled temperature units or CTUs for short. So in order to provide assurance that product is being maintained at the required temperatures, uh, a, pre a precise calibrated and validated temperature monitoring system should be equipped for each individual CTU at the provider. So this system needs to be 21 CFR part 11 and, GAMP, and a GAMP5 uh, validated system. It needs to provide continuous monitoring of the chamber conditions, whether that be temperature and RH or, or one or the other, depending on the specific need. Uh, system needs to be able to have an alert notification uh, system within it. Uh, so an alert notification system will will uh, alar alarm designated personnel uh, in the event a chamber falls outside of the designated acceptable range. It should come with 24-7 on-call support capabilities, the ability to call out to designated personnel, designated and trained personnel uh, that are available to respond at all times in the event uh, an alarm does come through. Another thing is it needs to be able to retain that historical data. Uh, that's in, in order to prove, uh, excuse me, in order to prove to prove temperature compliance uh, during quality reviews. There's also some advanced concepts of temperature monitoring and climate control that are a huge plus and a benefit if the system is able to provide it. Uh, the first one is early warning capabilities. So those are, are systems that are set up to identify variations uh, in temperature in these units prior to them reaching their out of tolerance limits. And the whole reason for that is it's a proactive approach to mitigate uh, the risk and the occurrence of temperature excursions in the product environment itself. The next advanced concept is predictive monitoring. So predictive monitoring is a, it's an intuitive system that tracks the performance of, cham of the chamber's mechanical system itself. And the whole design is to identify potential issues within a unit before the actual product environment itself is effective. Uh, this can be crucial to identify potential issues sometimes months in advance of the product environment seeing seeing an effect of those potential issues climate control uh, of course climate control a uh, climate control system is designed to reduce the buildup of frost inside freezers uh, mitigating that buildup of frost leads to a reduction uh, excuse me an increase in efficiency and a reduction of defrost cycles in the unit itself just as important with these controls, standard operating procedures, uh, it should have detailed alarm response protocols for personnel. Uh, it ensures that training and the response to alarms is being followed in a consistent manner throughout the organization. And it leads to a cohesive response in the event of an alarm. So building off of temperature monitoring and control, we're gonna move right into humidity monitoring, monitoring and control. So of course, humidity control is necessary for stability chambers or other designated chambers that have specific humidity requirements based off of your product's needs. Uh, we wanna control the humidity, make sure, sure we're within those acceptable ranges at all times. But in addition to that, in chambers in which mold growth is a potential concern, 
uh, the introduction of a dry air system helps mitigate that risk and mitigate the chances of mold growing in that environment. But ultimately, uh, the provider should have a cleaning program in place. As with any other, other function, there should be SOPs that detail the cleaning program and how it's performed. Uh, this program should also identify the interval at, in which cleanings of specific chambers or room types are performed. They have to be documented uh, as they're performed and they need to detail exactly what was performed for those individual units and when. In conjunction with the cleaning program, an area and inspection process should be in place. Uh, this process should be performed by a member of the, of the uh, provider's quality department and that should be in partnership with the business area. The reason for this, uh, it needs to be documented and performed at a set interval, of course, uh, but the whole goal of it is to identify and mitigate potential issues that may not be uh, captured during that standard cleaning process. So it's a deeper look into the facility and the product environments, uh, just to make sure that you're remaining compliant as far as cleaning goes. Uh, so to wrap this up, maintaining, controlling, and monitoring temperature and humidity is a critical function for all storage providers. Uh, and just to reiterate, a, pre a precisely calibrated and validated monitoring system ensures accuracy, reliability, and consistent intended performance of those systems. Uh, so very, very critical that it's a, it's a validated monitoring system. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll send it back to Kaylin and she'll introduce the next talk. Okay, thank you, Mike. So Mike obviously went over some excellent, excellent information. It is absolutely essential to ensure your products remain at temperature while in storage. So Mike did a great job of explaining all those information as to why and how it's monitored and kept at storage temperature. So next up, we have Michelle Mayer back again, and she's going to be talking about product safety and inventory control. Michelle. Thank you, Kaylin. Yes, I'm back again. Um, so not only is it critical to uh, you know that measures are in place to ensure your product is in a safe and secure location at proper temperatures uh, with all the controls that that Mike mentioned as well, but also that the identity of your product is safeguarded while in someone else's care. It's no longer going to be in your freezer and you want to make sure that whoever has it is going to treat it uh, the same way that you would as if it was in your own your own location. So um, number one, I guess, uh, for you is to verify that they have a validated inventory management system of some form. Uh, I could, there's many different platforms to use, but make sure that one is in place. Data integrity is critical. And within this system, there should be an audit trail that provides insight to all activities and any alterations to data that occur once it's been entered. Um, you need traceability to the exact location of the product. All movement should be documented in the system. And uh, there should be multiple barcoded levels. Um, so physical barcodes on hopefully the chamber, the shelf your product is on, to the bins or the racks holding your product. Um, and this is, this, these are all important because you want to know exactly where your product is at all times. You wanna be able to uh, verify that it is where it is supposed to be. The system should also be capable of processes that will minimize manual data entry. So for example, the capability for direct upload from other databases is great, or even Excel-based lists, which means there's minimal need for transcription by human hands. Uh, it'll cut back on data entry errors. Um, it should have barcode reading and um, possibly even radio frequency ID or RFID capabilities. So for example, capability to read barcodes that you may have on your own product and you use that as an identifier. Having these in place um, has, is known to increase overall count and pick accuracy and can minimize the need for periodic cycle counting as well. Um, so the, the positive impact um, of this you know, validated system with these capabilities is loss mitigation, as well as minimizing costs associated with manual counting and then correcting errors that result from human, uh, human errors for data entry and transcription. Um, number two on this topic is product segregation. You want to ensure that your product is going to be securely held, segregated from any other client's material if you're in a shared chamber, 
both electronically and physically. So it should be documentable, documented in the inventory database, as well as capability to physically segregate. Um, so uh, there should also be capability if, if it's your own product and you want to make sure that there's segregation of lots maintained while it's in storage if you have lot control product. Uh, these are both going to minimize the risk of any cross-contamination and mixing of lots, which could potentially damage your product. Uh, that does it for me. I'm handing it back over to Mike to cover the last portion of this topic, which is material handling and safety. Thank you. There you go, Mike. All right, thank you, Michelle. All right, so last topic, material handling and safety. So you want to ensure that the storage provider is equipped to safely load and unload, transport your material, uh, make, essentially making sure that they're equipped and they have the right tools for the, for the job. Uh, so the first thing you want to look at is their loading and unloading areas. Are they appropriately sized? Uh, if they have dock leveling systems, that's a bonus. It provides a, a larger range in the type of vehicles that the provider can load and unload uh, in the most in the safest manner possible. So this is the ability to load and unload all sorts of different containers that may show up uh, in a variety of vehicles, whether it's 53 foot trucks, uh, small box trucks, vans, courier services, and things like that. Uh, so the next thing you're going to look at is the equipment. What kind of equipment does the provider have? Is it applicable to to the uh, to the function that they're performing for you? So, for example, uh, if you're looking in, in a warehouse type type environment, you want to make sure they have forklifts. And the type of forklifts they have is also is also key. Uh, if they have forklifts with proxy sensors or a drive-by wire system, uh, that's a huge bonus. What that does is it allows for safe transport within those warehouse areas during the put away of materials. It basically controls the forklift's path for the user itself, so they can focus on handling the material on the lift so they don't they can go up and down the aisles basically uh, the next thing you want to look at is do they have racks carts jacks to transport material within the facility you absolutely don't want personnel handling the material walking to and from locations uh, so having the equipment to transport material appropriately is critical are the employees trained in the safe in safe material handling practices again do they have the right tools for the jobs? Do they understand how materials need to be handled? Uh, it's, it's very critical. And really what you wanna look for is, are they equipped and prepared to meet your needs? Uh, so materials come, come in all different shapes and sizes. Not only that, but the containers in which they arrive also come in a variety of sizes. So you wanna make sure that the provider's familiar with those shipping systems and they have the capability and the ability to handle those systems when they arrive. A couple other things to, to uh, look for is, do they have a, uh, a PPE program? So do they have the right personal protective equipment for their applications? If they're handling dry ice or liquid nitrogen, for example, uh, if they have large walk-in freezers, do they have the appropriate gear for their personnel to be handling your material in the most safe and effective manner? And the last topic I wanna touch on is hazardous material control. Uh, so this is, this is of course, uh, very important. Uh, the provider should have a has, a has excuse me a hazardous material control program in place. Uh, the process should be identified and how they identify, approve, and store material. Uh, they need to be aware of what they're taking in. You can imagine the provider probably has multiple customers, so they need to have an awareness of the type of material that they allow into their facility for storage. They should also have a priority on their employees' safety. So all employees should have access to those safety data sheets that tell you what that material is in the event of emergency. To follow that up, there should, of course, again, be procedures in place that detail some of those uh, material handling concerns in the event of emergencies as well. Uh, so those are, again, just a few things to look out regarding material handling and safety. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone again for their time today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Back to you, Kayla. Thank you both, Mike and Michelle, for that. That was some fantastic information, starting with the validated inventory system. So that is critical, right? Because you absolutely want to understand where your materials are. Materials aren't in your facility, now they're offsite somewhere else. So when you want to be able to have visibility to that, so you clearly understand what is kept offsite at that storage provider. And you're also going to be able to tell your storage provider the information that you need recorded off of those items. So if you need 
unique things like lot number, exp expiration date, whatever you need. So all that will be tracked within that validated inventory system. And also a lot of things that Mike Devonzo touched on as well too. Absolutely essential to think about some of those things. If you are planning on having a large envirotainer bringing product to the storage provider, that's some things that you absolutely want to communicate with the storage provider to ensure that they can actually handle receiving in product off of an envirotainer. So thank you both very much for that. And that leads us to our second audience poll question. So again, we're going to give you 30 seconds for the following question. What's your main reason for considering off-site GMP storage? Are you looking to add storage capacity? Is it for risk mitigation or disaster recovery? Are you transitioning from R&D to commercial, com commercialization or other? And please feel free to type in your answer in the chat box and we will be able to discuss some of those others during the Q&A at the end of the webinar. We'll give you a couple seconds. Thank you. Okay, I think we're just wrapping it up right now. Okay, so it looks like we've got almost a tie for looking to add storage capacity as well as risk mitigation or disaster recovery, absolutely important items, and then transitioning from R&D and then others. So we look forward to answering the others at the end of the Q&A. Uh, so this leads us to our next slide, uh, which will be Stephanie will be discussing um, the quality management system. Stephanie. Hi, thank you, Kaylin. Um, I'm Stephanie Dumas, the quality supervisor, um, and I partner with the biorepository here at Massey. Um, so I'm here today to cover some of the basic quality management system or QMS components um, that you should look for when you're choosing a storage provider. Uh, so it is important to have a storage provider who has an established quality management system um, and understands those GMP regulations. Uh, so you want you want your provider to be treating this material as if it was their own, as it, with you know the hands that you would treat it with in your own facility. Uh, so the first topic I'm going to touch upon is document control. Uh, so the documents are the building blocks of any business. Um, we've heard documents procedures mentioned a few times here today already. Um, so the doc a document control program is going to support the management of your files uh, by ensuring that documents are reviewed for adequacy and compliance and that they're approved before use. Uh, the program should have a process in place to prevent the unintended use of obsolete documents. Um, we know that inadvertent use of any out-of-date documents can have significant negative consequences across the organization. Um, a document control program is going to establish consistency between because only those approved current versions of documents um, are going to be used by everybody. Uh, the program should ensure that the documents are also periodically reviewed um, and then that any updates are made as necessary. Um, and then you also want to ensure that they contain a complete revision history. Um, the second topic would be a learning management or training program. Um, so it's not, it's not required, but it is useful to have a document control system which integrates with your learning management system. Um, this way, when your documents are revised, the employee will be automatically notified that they have something that they need to train on. Uh, a good training program is going to ensure that the employees have the skills and knowledge to perform their jobs uh, and to ensure compliance with any applicable regulations. Um, so this training could be a read and understand of the document. Um, it could have some quiz questions. Uh, it could be something like a classroom training or an on-the-job training where those skills can be documented. Um, some critical training topics should include uh, absolutely the receipt and handling of product, um, performing inventory. Um, another important one would be the uh, IATA and DOT training for shipment of any dangerous goods. Um, Michael mentioned early, earlier some uh, safety and security SOPs. So that could include, um, you know, the cold weather training, you know, negative 75 is no joke of an environment to go into. Um, so making sure your personnel are safe, their personal protective equipment, um, and then of course alarm responses as mentioned previously too. Um, and additionally, your employees, the, the employees that you're, you're looking to use, um, you should really make sure that they're trained on uh, GMPs and good documentation practices. 
um, and really all other components of a quality management system, um, such as change control, uh, data integrity, um, and investigations. Uh, so that will lead us to uh, investigations in a, a CAPA program. Um, you want to make sure they really have a robust system in place um, and that they're notifying you of any events that, that do occur. Um, the employee, all employees um, should be trained on how to identify and report any issues that they come across. And then all of those issues must be investigated. So this will determine the underlying root cause, and then it will aid in the development of any corrective and preventive actions. Um, so to not only to correct the issue, but to prevent it from occurring again. Um, and as I mentioned before, or as it was mentioned before, um, it's critical to, uh, to be reviewing the, the uh, temperature and humidity of the storage chambers. Um, so while those alarms that the, you know, the team might receive for any out of spec conditions, um, so those are some things that will require you know, immediate action on. But reviewing those temperature and humidity trends on a regular basis can help you be a little more proactive in identifying any equipment issues before they would lead to an excursion. Uh, so, you know, it might, it'll be perfectly normal to see short spikes or dips in your data, and it's really going to be due to di uh, typical day-to-day -day use of the chamber, such as uh, adding or removing product, uh, maybe preventative maintenance. Uh, however, any other anomalies that you see, um, such as a slight drift, they should be analyzed by your facilities or HVAC team, because um, this could be an indicator of some potential deterioration occurring in the unit. Um, and those slight drifts might not be detectable on a day-to-day -day basis as you're going through, but if you're reviewing a month's worth of data at a time, um, it might be a little more prominent and indicative that some additional maintenance is needed. And the storage provider, uh, the storage provider you choose should have those trends available for you to review. Um, so this will support your product storage or stability program requirements. Um, so thank you for your time today. Um, if you do have any additional questions on quality management system components, um, I'd be happy to answer them for you at the Q and A portion. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. That was some excellent information. So thank you for that. And that brings us to our conclusion. So we hope that we have been able to provide you some insight into the GMP storage process. We've gone over a lot of different things today. We've talked about some of the things you need to be thinking about prior to storing materials off site. We've talked about site integrity. We've talked about the facility. We've talked about temperature and product safety, as well as validated systems, as well as the robust quality management system. So I hope you can take away from today that wherever you decide to store your goods, you want to make sure that you are absolutely comfortable with wherever you're storing your goods. You want to feel comfortable that they're handling your products safely and securely, that it's going to be stored at temperature, and not only that it's going to be stored at temperature, but that you can have that proven. So if you require temperature records of that, that make sure that they're able to provide that to you. Uh, you want to make sure your products inventory correctly. That's essential in your process. If you're getting ready to ship product out, you got to look at your inventory and it's not inventoried the way you expect, critical to have that done. You want to make sure that wherever you go, they're able to pack out your materials properly, that they understand exactly your requirements. It's critical. The products kept at storage, it's been at temperature the whole time. It's still essential to get from the storage provider onto its next location. So making sure they understand the whole process as well as transporting it safely and securely. So you truly want to have a relationship, a partnership, and a dialogue and being able to explain all of the things you need to provide that safe and secure uh, storage for you. You truly want to get the understanding that they're looking at this as more than just storing a box, that they see the long term of this, that whether it's a, the next cure, the next drug, the next medical device, next food, next product, whatever it may be, that they truly understand that and that you guys are working together on making sure that you have the best storage solution for you guys. So thank you so much for your time today and we are anxious to move into the question period. So uh, we look forward to answering any questions you have. Amy. Great, thanks, Kaylin. Um, if you haven't had a chance to send in a question yet, feel free to do so now in the question drop down or through the chat. 
Um, we do have a few um, other members of our team joining us for the question and answer session. We have John Masiello, who is our, the executive VP of Masi Bioservices, and also John Orange, the director of operations for our biorepository here at Masi. So welcome, John and John. Um, so our first question that I have for our panelists is how are temp and humidity records delivered um, to the client digitally or another way? Um, I can take that question. Okay. Um, so yeah, it, it helps to have um, it helps to have that knowledge up front if if you're if you are requiring um, to have temperature trends. Um, and then, um, at least I know for us anyway, um, we do have them set up uh, to where you know, the first week of the month, we send them out, we send a PDF of the, the graph to our customers. Um, so it is, it could, it could be any way you want really, um, but that is the typical way we, we send it out. Great. All right, um, the next question is, how do you track customer materials in your biorepository? Maybe Michelle, you might have an answer for this. Yeah, sure, I can take that one. When product is received here um, at Massey and accepted into the biorepository, it's then entered and tracked in a validated inventory database, which we did mention. It does have an audit trail. And what we do is we take specific details from your product labels so that the, the items are easily identified later both in the database as well as as it's sitting on the shelf. Um, and then the locations are also assigned to them and, and tracked in the inventory management system, um, which allows for easy access later by personnel when accessing the product for return shipments or for other needs. Okay, um, is a humidity control system required for mold and ice buildup prevention? And if not, what other measures can be used? So I'll go ahead and take that one, Amy. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, so is a humidity control system required for mold and ice buildup prevention? I think there's two answers for that. The first one would be uh, for stability chambers or for chambers that have specific humidity requirements. Absolutely, you need a control system in place. You need to stay within those specifications. Um, but as far as uh, for, chamber, for chambers where humidity is not necessarily something that needs to be uh, within a certain range. Uh, it's not required to have a system in there and it's not really, I wouldn't use the word control, I would probably use the word mitigate. So you wanna minimize uh, the amount of humidity in those environments or to mitigate that potential for mold growth. And that can, that can be controlled through those dry air systems. Uh, and then just to touch on the uh, frost, the ice buildup and the frost prevention, again, those dry air systems are a very effective method of mitigating that ice buildup uh, within those units. And again, that leads to increased efficiency in the unit and the uh, reduction in amount of defrost cycles that need to be performed. And then just one thing real quick, I just thought of uh, going back to the, the mold uh, mitigation. Uh, some business areas don't allow corrugated cardboard boxes in their lab areas. Uh, so with that, going back to what I mentioned before, that robust cleaning program is also an effective tool that could be that is utilized to help mitigate uh, that potential as well in those environments. I, I could add very good, Mike. I could add the as far as USP and the storage in warehousing requires monitoring of humidity. Let's face it, if it gets very very high and with cardboard in there, there's a high probability of mold, mildew, and and, and, and issues. And so. What we would recommend is the desiccant dryers or so. And we found that what was helpful because it, in order to mitigate that is we have you know, gas-fired ones, electric ones, and backup and stuff like that. But it's not typical in the industry to do that. But it's very, very important because when if, you, if, you, if your cleaning program is based off of time and you have mold that shows up somewhere like on the summer months, you know, but not in the winter months, and there's a little more mold, and that's not a that's not a good thing. So if you dry it, you keep it dry, then you're able to handle it throughout the year. So great. Okay. Our next question is: How often does a storage chamber need to be requalified for GMP? I'll take that one as well. 
Um, okay, so that's a great question. It does come up a lot here. Um, I can say that each company probably has their own process, but generally all storage chambers would require requalification if the set point is being changed for one. And then for routine requalification, it really depends on the amount of risk associated with the interval that, that uh, you'd be proposing. So um, I would say that for the most part, the intervals can range anywhere between 12 months to five years, depending on the risk and how critical it is. So for example, if you have a robust monitoring system with redundant sensors, meaning more than um, a single monitoring point in the chamber, you may be more comfortable with defending a wider requalification window that you know, maybe can span multiple years. So it's really, it's really up to the, the facility and um, what they're doing there. Okay. Next question, how far in advance should I plan for offsite storage? And Kaylin, I know you, you spoke about this briefly in the presentation, but did you wanna address that again in a little more detail? Yes, I would be happy to. So as we discussed in the presentation today, there is a lot to consider when you're thinking about offsite storage, right? You need to understand what you wanna store offsite, um, where you need to store offsite, how much material you're looking to store offsite. So the sooner you can start gathering that information and having a clear understanding of exactly what it is that you wanna get from your facility to a storage provider. And then also taking a step back and understanding, again, is this just a short-term need or a long-term need? And as your needs grow, is your storage provider going to be able to handle those for you? So the sooner you can investigate that process and truly understand, it's going to help smooth your transition process and it's going to prevent you having any of those issues where you have shipments coming in, you don't know where to put them, you have no space for it, or you have the aging equipment that you're just concerned about, you know, day after day, you're worried if today's the day. So making sure you have all this in place prior and up front is just going to streamline the process and make it much easier for you. Great question. If I, if I can add to that too, is is some things take time in quality agreements, legal agreements for comp, you know, to understand what the expectations are for each party takes time. And sometimes the people that are talking saying, I need storage right away, may not be the ones making the decision that, you know, dotting the I's and making sure everything is 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 uh in place. So it does take time. So uh, it can range from uh could be a year to uh, next day, depending on how fast and efficient uh, the team members are. And just to add, I think it would help, uh, you know, having an understanding of what your supplier qualification program is for your own for your own company. Um, John mentioned quality agreements. You might need to schedule an audit. So um, just understanding what your own internal needs are um, can help in, you know, guiding through that process. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to throw it out there. I have one minute, but we're going to do it. The last question that I have is what training programs are necessary for biopharma storage employees? And Stephanie, maybe you can speak to this as well. I know you have a lot of experience in this area. Uh, sure, certainly. Thank you for the question. Um, so training, um, it's really, you know, the proper handling um, you know, the incoming and shipping of the materials is really essential. Um, and then, of course, any of the IATA or DOT for any dangerous goods. Um, and other things that come to mind, again, I, I think I mentioned them before, is the GMPs and GDPs. So you you really want to make sure that the employees who are taking care of your product are, you know, they're going to treat it the same way that, that you would treat it in your own facility. Um, I think... Safety, any safety um, SOPs? Yeah, all of the safety SOPs as well. So, you know, not only ensuring that our, our you know, the employees are safe from uh, from the product, but but also making sure that the employees are safe from the the environment that they're in as well. Um, and of course, cleaning. Um, I know Michelle, you had mentioned pest control. So, you know, you want to make sure if somebody sees some sort of critter or you know bug or something that they're they're identifying it to the appropriate people so that you can take action uh, where necessary okay well thank you all for your questions and for taking time out of your day to join us this afternoon 
if you submitted any questions that we weren't able to get to, we, I will send those along to our panelists and we will reach out to you for answers. Um, you can also find contact information for everyone on the handout, on the control panel, and a library of all our previous webinars are on our website and our YouTube channel. If you want to check out any other presentations we've done, we have a whole catalog of them. So check that out. And thank you again for coming this afternoon. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Wonderful job. Thanks, everyone.